SV, a Let's Talk Theory lesson, where we are going to cover all the stuff that goes on before you actually start building your site. First on our list is layouts, and first we're going to discuss the column layout. Now if you look at the picture of the little computer screen that we have on the right, you can see that this website is made up of columns. So it is a simple and streamlined design, and it allows the user's eyes to simply gaze over the page and follow as per column. So we can see the navigation there has got its images and text, and it is very easy for me to locate. It's very simple in terms of the navigation, and very straightforward for the user to understand. And it's also going to draw focus to central elements of the site. So when you look at this, the first thing you see is the picture, and then your eyes are drawn up to online school. What this does is just allow us to decide where we want the user to focus their attention when engaging with our websites. The next common option at the moment that's become very popular is having a full screen image, and this is using an image to, to cover the full screen. So over here we can see we've got a digital agency, and they've got a picture of a desk with uh, a keyboard and a phone, so they're basically saying they're quite a smart company, very streamlined. So we can see this is a very smart, sleek company and that everything is very well streamlined. We've also got text functionalities that are going to be placed on top of the image. So as we can see here, they've used their gray area to write their text on as opposed, as opposed to on the white keyboard or piece of paper. And this also draws us to the focus point of the site. And this just allows your user to get an immediate understanding of your website. So if this website had the picture changed and it was a hamburger, we would all assume that the website was food related. Then we have the grid layout, and this is more commonly used for things like your magazines, and it is a very clear layout. The main elements of the, of the site are linked together in a very logical way. So you would often have little groupings as we see on this site. We've got travel, music, and lifestyle, which all link together nicely. And then we've got techno or technology separate to that. And it just allows things to be put into logical groupings. And it's also going to encourage uniformity and appropriate groupings. So it just allows you to very clearly group things together that are related. You don't want to confuse the user by looking like you just threw everything into one section and they must go and scavenge through. And next we have headline and thumbnail. And what a thumbnail is, it is a, it is a smaller representation of a larger image. So the user then has the choice if they would like to select the smaller image and enlarge it to its full size. This just makes sites a lot easier to navigate because, I mean, if these were all full-size images, we'd have about a 20-page website, and no one really has the time for that, so you could just go and click on certain images. This is very handy in image galleries. The next thing we want to talk about is content, and this is going to make up the bulk of your website. So the key things we need to consider within our content is the design, user experience, visual design, structure, and our font or typography. We're going to go and talk about each of these individually now. Let's start with typography. So what is typography? Well, it's how we render text in different ways. There are thousands of different types of typographies, so why don't you all go ahead and type into Morpheus what your favorite font is. If you all know, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but I use Leto and Open Sans Light throughout all my presentations, just because I like how they look. And then we're also going to allow that to measure the legibility and tone. So the fonts that I've chosen are very easy to read, and they have quite a professional look about them. They're not all squiggly or too cursive, because I want them to be easy to read. And then you can see here on the right, I've got a bit more of a fun font, where it's a bit more cursive and a bit more funky. That you could use on quite a, a young, fun page, but you wouldn't use it for a professional worksheet. Then, little fun fact I learned and I wanted to share with all of you, 
is what does serif mean? So it defines a decorative line that decorates a letter. So you have sans serif, which means without text decoration, but I'm going to show you quickly. So we've got over here sans serif, which is now without any decoration. And then if we have serif, you can see that those lines have been added on and weirdly make things look a lot fancier. But I, I really just, I, I needed to tell people about this. <laughs> it blew my mind. So within typography, we've got serif. And what serif means is it defines a decorative line that decorates a letter. So just to compare this, let's have a look. And you can see sans serif, so without serif. We've got a very plain letter E. And with serif, we've got all that decoration that just makes it look a hell of a lot more fancy. And I went and had a bit of fun here and demonstrated a few of the different fonts that we can find. So each of these are the same size, but just within different font families. So if you're all going to, to write up a professional business letter, which font would you use? You can type this into Morpheus and we can see what everyone thinks. And if you were to invite your friends to a fancy dinner party, which one would you choose then? I think it's always very interesting and I look forward to seeing all of your responses. I personally would use Georgia for a more professional letter. And I, for let's see, for a fancy dinner party, would probably use, hmm, maybe Mistral. It looks, it looks fancy. But that is all, again, up to the individual. Next, we're going to talk about user experience. User experience can be broken down into different sections. Firstly, we have the interface. So what does the user interact with on your site? Navigation. So how do they look at the different pages that you have created? The structure, what is the flow of your website? So from your home page, how many different options do the users have? Design, so what choices have you made between your layout, color schemes, and all the little small things that work together to make an amazing site? HCI, which is your human-computer interaction. So a lot of you will probably have noticed in the last few years, when you switch on a computer, sometimes it will greet you by name. So when I turn on my computer, it says, hello, Kate, and it makes me feel special. <laughs> so there's a lot of study going on in this realm at the moment about whether we want to feel like a computer is something that's actually speaking to us directly to make it feel a little bit less like a machine. We've got user research, so looking into what the current trends are within the buyer's market and just helping that to determine who we target when we are doing our designs. I don't know how many of you are good <laughs> with tools and things. I personally am terrible. So if I'm using a tool, I need to have a step-by-step -step instruction. So although most of us have grown up in the age of technology, a lot of people are not familiar with computers. So having a very simple and easy-to-read site is very important because we don't want to overcomplicate things because we get frustrated very quickly and people will leave your site. And last but not least, we have accessibility. So how many different things do I have to provide in order to, be, in order to be able to access your site? Do I need to give you my postal address, my home location? You know, people don't want to give that to a website that they're not familiar with and that they aren't sure is trustworthy. So we need to make sure that only if necessary we're asking users for this information and that they can access our site easily. So I briefly spoke about what human-computer interaction is, but let's talk a bit more about it. So what it does is it evaluates such situations and environments in which technologies and people work together. It's designed to promote efficiency and productivity, and it focuses on user experience goals, which we are going to talk about a bit more shortly. And studies have been conducted on the interactions to ensure the safety of human cognition and sensation. So the people who work in HCI, or human-computer interaction, see it as a crucial in instrument to popularize the idea that the interaction between a human and the user should resemble a normal human-to-human -human conversation. 
So that's, that's why often when you turn on your computer, it will say hello to you. And when you, um, when you finish with your computer, it will say goodbye. You'll also see this with things like, um, even when you're getting a, a parking ticket, uh, when you arrive, it'll say, welcome, please do this and this. And then when you leave, it'll tell you to have a great day. So they're just trying to mimic an interaction between two people. Another important thing is we need to research our users. So here are a few questions you can ask yourself before you begin designing a site. Firstly, what are the users good and bad at? So what level of technological knowledge do your users have? Are you designing a site for young people who know all the tips and tricks for using the more complicated sites? Or are you aiming it at older generations who might not have as much technical know-how as we do? The next thing is, how can you help them with the way they currently do things? So what is your site bringing to the table? What system or what process are you improving? Is it worth doing or is it something they could just make a phone call over or that a pamphlet could tell them? Think about what will provide a quality user experience. So if they're just wanting to get online and do something quickly, there's no point having a fancy loading screen and all these different buttons and things that no one actually needs. Then listen to people's wants and needs and get them involved in the design process. Quite a nice technique to use here is by asking users for feedback and getting a variety of different people to test out your site before you take it live. So you can ask friends, family, co-workers, anyone, just to get a very broad understanding of what people want and what they need. And then use tried and tested techniques in the design. So don't try and revolutionize design on a very simple website. Rather go and use techniques that other people have tried and that have proven effective. Then we go on to design principles. So these are the things you need to take into deep consideration before designing a site. So the first on the list is visibility. What visibility means is that the more the more visible or the more available your options are to the user, the more likely they are to interact with them and to be familiar with how to go about interacting with them. Another important thing is that if users haven't seen anything before or if it's hidden on the bottom of your website, then they sometimes won't even realize it's there and they won't know how to use them in the first place. So you need to make sure that things are visible, the important things at least are visible, and the first thing that catches your user's eye, and the less important things you can have, you know, not hidden, but in the less obvious positions on your page, and then you can draw attention to those using color, or use them in a menu rather, where the user's pushing next, and get them to that functionality. The next step is feedback. Now, why feedback is important is you want users to know firstly that something's worked. So I don't know if you've ever saved a document and there's no pop-up message. And you end up sitting there for a few minutes going, well, did it work? So that is something that is so important with anything on computers or the web or on phones. We like to know that something has worked or we like to be informed if it hasn't worked. Because the next thing you send off an email and you don't get your little pop-up saying your email has been sent, then we sit worrying or actually don't even check and then you realize three days later you never sent that email or you never actually paid your rent. So this is so important whether it be a warning sign on your computer where it makes a noise when your battery is low or your normal informational feedback pop-up messages. These are things we need to always pay attention to in terms of feedback. Then we have constraints. Now the idea with constraints, constraints is to limit the amount of human error. So I don't know how many of you have ever seen someone put numbers into a name field. These constraints make sure that the input you're getting from a user is valid. So if they've gone and said an email address but they haven't put the at sign, you can then flag a user and say this is not a valid email address, for example. So this, having these constraints in place are going to stop the user's mistakes and then hopefully make it a more enjoyable experience for them because they know that things have worked nicely. And in turn, this will increase the usability of your site and reduce error. And lastly, we have affordance. 
Now, what a affordance is, is your properties of an object. So an object on your website, whether it be a button or a menu, anything that your user is interacting with. So what, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that people know that they can click on this or that they can you know, adjust the screen or open up a new functionality similar to like a hamburger menu. You want to know that people know if they click on those three lines that the menu will then expand. And things like buttons, we like to make big red buttons or colorful buttons so that we can encourage the user and draw their eye to that functionality so that it is used properly. The next thing we want to talk about is usability. So this explains how easy it is for a software or a website, basically anything in your life, how easy it is to use and how easy it fits in. So within here we have effectiveness. So effectiveness means that are you actually producing the result that you wanted? So if I go on to my banking app, am I actually getting my banking done? Then we have safety, and that is really there to just stop users from doing silly stuff. You don't want dangerous errors where you accidentally delete their whole account history because they pushed a button they shouldn't have. And that is why some, some websites will actually prompt you to type in keywords or random letters that they provided with you to ensure you would in fact like to take an action like deleting an account or deleting payment histories, anything that is going to be considered like a crucial error on their part, we like to just be, are you sure you want to do this? So this is something that's good in determining that they have a good experience and that your site is usable and that they are not messing up. Then we have learnability, which is pretty self-explanatory, but it's just how easy, it, how easy is it to learn to use your site and how are first-time visitors going to feel about it? So there are no nasty surprises hiding. Is it very plain and straightforward, or is it something they're going to have to learn how to interact with? Then efficiency is a measure of how well a website does what it's supposed to. So there's no use using a photo website where it takes, I don't know, three hours to upload a single photo, because then you could just find another site that does it hopefully a, like a lot faster than that, but that will come into how user-friendly or the usability of your site, because you want things to be done and you want them to be done quickly. We are a generation of people who want everything, want it quickly, and we want it done properly, which is a good thing, but we need to remember that when designing sites. And then lastly on our list is memorability. So how, is it, how easy is it to remember how to interact with your site after you haven't used it in a long time? So how many of you are confident that if you didn't use Facebook for a year, if you went back on, would you know where everything was and how to use it? And the memorability and learnability go hand in hand. So will people remember our site? Will they remember how to use it? And if anything changes, will they be able to learn about the new functionality on our site? Then this brings me to quite a fun thing. Um, I found this very interesting, and it's called the Rule of Seven. So the reason that there's a Rule of Seven is that if there are only seven items, they can be scanned very quickly visually. So the, the more complicated side of this is that human short-term memory capabilities are very limited. They're, so it's a good idea to have small chunks of information that users can then absorb and retain rather than having a list of 50 things and they only can remember two because they're trying to remember 50 things. So no more than seven options are key. So you don't want more than seven bullet points in a list. You don't want more than seven items on a menu. You want to keep things below seven. So your guidelines. You want short paragraphs containing two to three sentences, and you want them separated by white space. You want a clearly visible hierarchy with headings and subheadings. And you want short lines of text up to 80 characters. So if any of you are looking back on my slides, go and have a look and see. And if I'm not, tell me if I'm following the rule of seven. 
And lastly, there's a term called chunking, which was introduced by Miller in his 1965 paper. What chunking means is it's breaking up conde- content into di- digestible bits, so into smaller bits that people can then remember and retain. So rather than just dumping a huge paragraph on a page, just give key points and then explain further, or just break it down into its simplest form so that users will remember. So the rule of seven in essence is just highlighting key areas rather than overloading any users or visitors to your site. Next time you are doing something or sending an email or or, um, doing a presentation, try and look at it and just think, am I applying the rule of seven? And you'll actually be very interested to see how you can improve things and how you can improve your delivery of things using this technique. Next on our list we've got graphics, and these and graphics are very important. If you have poorly designed images on your site, there's not going to be much faith in your site to begin with. So there's a very interesting concept that I love talking about, and that is the color wheel. Now the color wheel was designed by Sir Isaac, Isaac Newton in 1706, and I've got an image here of the color wheel on the right. So that is different gradients of our main colored groups. And they all start with a natural progression from dark to light. So they all start off as their darkest color and then move slowly into a more light section. And then finally into white. And then a fun fact is that when the wheel spins at a fast enough speed, the human eye will only see white. There's actually quite a fun little thing you can all try at home. When you get a piece of string and you make a little color wheel and you spin it, it will spin white. I tried to make this work for all of you, but unfortunately my software doesn't allow it to spin this fast, but I tried. So if you can get that to spin fast enough, it will spin white, which I think is very cool. Then within our color wheel, we have different color schemes. So the first one is complementary. So colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel are considered to be complementary colors. So there, if you go and draw this out yourself or play around with it later, you can see which colors will work well together and they must be directly opposite each other. So here we have orange and blue, which most of the time I don't think many people would consider. So it's quite a lot of fun. When I'm talking about these, think of brands or franchises that you know and think about what colors they're actually using in their logos. And feel free to post, put that on Morpheus because I've had a lot of fun researching this and all the different colors that I thought would never go together in very popular brands. So this is a rectangular color scheme that uses four colors arranged in pairs of two complementary colors. So in this scenario, we've got red, orange, blue, and green. So we've got the orange and the green are complementary, as well as the blue and the red. Next, we have analogous color scheme. And this color scheme uses colors that are next to each other on their color wheel. So they're using the three colors that are all next to each other. This one for me makes more sense because that's a blue, a dark bluey green, and then our standard like grass green, which I think would go nicely together. Then we have triadic, and that is a color scheme that uses colors that are evenly spaced around the color wheel. So from this circle, we then get a triangle. So here we have orange, green, and purple. Now I'd just like you all to think about spinning these as we're going through. So if we moved it one up or if, you know, so draw it out on a piece of paper and you can spin the color wheel and think of different colors that you didn't expect that will match. Then we have square, which is nice and self-explanatory. The square color scheme is similar to the rectangle, but with four colors spaced evenly around the circle. So there we go. We've got quite an interesting color scheme there. And again, you could just spin this around and make lots of different color combinations. And then we've got the split split complement or split complementary. And the split complementary color scheme is a variation of the complementary color scheme. In addition to the base color, it uses two colors adjacent adjacent to its complement. So we've then got 
yellow and then normally it would be yellow and the first purple but we are now going towards the more maroon color and the darker purple so those will still match nicely we will be using these throughout the rest of our lessons in order to decide on color schemes for our websites so please do make sure that you understand this before we move on so what is color psychology well, color psychology evaluates the emotions and mental states as we're influenced by color. So they can be impacted by your, the tone of the color, the brightness, if there's a tint, or even just the shade of a color. So all those little filters we're all using on Instagram and all our different sites can actually affect how people feel about your photos or about images that you're putting online. So we've got our two main color categories. And they are warm, so warm would be your red, orange, yellow, and they're all next to each other on the color wheel. And these colors are going to invoke more feeling of happiness, um, good energy, joy, a bit of positivity in there. And your cool colors are going to include things like green, blue, and purple. And they are normally more soothing and can sometimes evoke a bit of a nice calm feeling. And on worst days, they can make you feel a little bit sad. So be careful with those. And my last point is, colors may be perceived differently in different cultures. So, for interest's sake, and so we can all learn, if there's a color that I say evokes a certain emotion, if it means something different in your culture, let us know so we can all learn from each other. And I think it would actually be very interesting. So if, through the next, chat, through the next slide, you disagree and say, in my culture it actually means this, I would be very interested to hear about it. Let's have a look at some different colors and what they bring out in us. So first we've got blue, and that's power, authority, strength, and intelligence. So here's my fun fact for the day. This blew my mind. The theme of Facebook is blue for a very specific reason, and it's because Mark Zuckerberg happens to be red, green, colorblind. So he, he basically had no choice but to select blue because he can see it clearly as blue. Isn't that so cool? He says it's the color he sees the best. So that is a key reason why Facebook is blue. Then we have green, and green is money, health, envy, and calmness. So a nice company to think about there is BP, and the reason that they use green on their outer sides of their emblem is to suggest that their particular brand is good for the environment and that is promoting a green approach. Then we have brown, which is stability, mourning, organic, and warmth. And you're mainly going to see brown in things like food. And because it's quite a strong color, it, is, um, it encourages earthiness as well and dependability. But brown is less, less likely seen as a brown color other than in the food industry. But quite a fun one is M&M's have got brown packaging and brown in their brand. And then um, there's also some more like Ups and Divine Chocolates that are going to use brown for their brands. Then we have orange, and orange stands for fun and adventure, power, authority, strength, intelligence. And you're going to see this associated with more of your fun and adventure brands. And that can include Fanta, Harley Davidson, and even MasterCard. Then we have purple. And purple is where we like to talk about royalty, wisdom, mystery, and spirituality. So a brand that you're going to see a lot of purple in is going to be more in the cosmetics industry. And it's going to basically sell a feeling of royalty or sophistication. And we can also see purple within the branding for Taco Bell, Hallmark, FedEx, and Roku. Then we have red... And red, love, romance, comfort, and energy. So we've all associated red with love or hate. So very different sides of the, of the emotional field. Um, but it'll just be, you know, content relate, context related for how you feel when you see red. But you'll see brands such as Nestle, Coke, Coca-Cola, and YouTube using red in their branding. And also KFC. Then we have grey. And the emotions that grey is going to encourage, let's say, are 
that it's practical, timeless, and neutral. So if we think about grey in terms of the Mercedes-Benz logo, it's a symbol of sophistication and luxury. And it translates this character to its target audience. So grey, you're going to see in a lot more of your fancy brands that are trying to sell, like wealth and practicality and just a timeless feel. Next we have black, which is power, authority, strength and intelligence. So black is used in brands such as Chanel and it's going to signify absolute prestige and just complete, just very classy. So black is used for a lot of classy um, brands and also to show off that it is superior to other brands. So black definitely makes quite a big statement. Then we have launch, which we're all waiting for. So when thinking about launching a site, we need to consider the domain names and how they are broken down. So here we've got a very basic domain name, so www.domainname.com. And then we've got the third level domain, the second level domain, and the top level domain. I know this is opposite to what I would like it to be. I would prefer top level to be WW, but unfortunately somebody else made that decision. So your www dot is third. So just think about it backwards when you're trying to remember for any tests. And this all together makes up your URL, which is your uniform resource, resource locator. So let's talk about third level domain. The third level domain or subdomain is most commonly www, which is the World Wide Web. The, the www is a network of content that can be viewed online and is formatted in HTML and can be accessed via HTTP, which is your hypertext transfer protocol. WWW is a network of content that can be viewed online and is formatted in HTML and can be accessed via HTTP, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. If you're ever in a situation when you want to sound really smart, ask someone what HTTP stands for. I do it a lot and hardly anyone knows, which is really surprising considering we come into contact with HTTP so often within the day. I mean, even to get on to any website, you have to go through your hypertext transfer protocol. Anyway, that's just what I do for fun because no one really knows. Then we have the second level domain, and like anything in life, there are rules when choosing your domain name. The first rule is that you may only include letters, numbers, and hyphens within your name. It may not exceed 63 characters and may not be less than three. And you may not breach another trademark, or you could be liable for legal action. So you can't just get there first and name your website after another trademarked company. And lastly, we have the top level domain, and this is the final section of your domain name. Originally, it was used to indicate the category that your site fits into. Management for the majority of top level domains is specified by ICANN. ICANN stands for Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. The next topic we're going to talk about is common top level domain names. So as I'm sure most of you will guess, .com is one of the more common ones. And it was intended for businesses but has since been opened up for more general purposes. We've also got .net which typically is used for internet service providers. There is also .org, which is generally used for non-profit organizations. If you have any other ones that you'd like to mention, please feel free to type those into Morpheus. Then we've got some common top-level domain names for organizations. So we've got .edu, which is used only for accredited educational institutions. .gov, which is used only for the United States government departments, and you'll see this has been adapted to .gov-uk or to whichever country it is, but .gov on its own is reserved for the United States. Then we've got .mil, which is used only for the United States military. Now there's something called DNS, which is Domain Name Systems, and this is a vital part of the internet that is often overlooked. Now, this blew my mind. 
So Kate's mind blowers. Did you know that there is a secret dot that you will never type or see at the end of every URL? So for our example, we've got www.domainname.com. This blew my mind. And what this dot is, is it represents the root of the Internet's name space. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's going to connect us to our DNS service, our domain, domain name system service, and are used to store databases of public IP addresses along with their host names. The next thing we're going to talk about is DNS service, so domain name system service. And what do these mean? So a DNS server is used to store databases of public IP addresses along with their host names. So just to put this into perspective, so we have www.domainname.com. This is that as an IP address. And just to take it one step further, this is it in binary code, so in computer languages. I think it's a lot easier to remember domain name than it is to remember that. So that is why we use IP addresses and host names. And what's important to remember about your host name is that they give the customer their first impression based on the wording and phrases that are used. So what is a web server? Well, a web server is used to hold your HTTP, which is... I hope you've all said this with me, so your hypertext transfer protocol, and they're used to present files in the form of web pages, which is your HTML, which is hypertext markup language. And then just a fun fact for you, any computer can be used as a web server as long as you take a few extra steps. I find quite a fun little illustration here. So let's run through this. So it's, um, if we're starting on the left, so I want to visit www.yoursite.com. I am going to send through a request. So from your computer or the client, you will go through the DNS server, and you will then go and try and find the IP address for your host name or your domain name. And then he will go and look for that IP address. Then the web server will locate your IP address and send it back, and that will be your HTTP response. Then the next time you go through this process and you go back to www.yoursite.com, you, your computer will remember the direct path to the web server with your request to visit yoursite.com. So when I say that your computer will remember the request, that is called your cache memory. Like cash, like dollar dollar bills, so your cache. Now what is cache? It is used to store data from previous requests. Okay, and it is going to increase your response time as well. Quite a nice example that I like to use for this is, uh, think about going into your friend's kitchen and trying to cook something. You have no idea where anything is. Now think about trying to cook in the same the same recipe in your kitchen where you know where everything is. How much faster, how much time do you think you're going to save when you're not having to look for everything? Well, that is the purpose of cache. It removes the guesswork and just knows where, whatever request you want, where it is, and how to access it as quickly as possible. So we've been talking about all these different aspects that make up a successful website, but how do we know if a site is actually succeeding? We can use key performance indicators or KPIs to measure the success of a website. A handy tool for this is Google Analytics, and this is a free software that allows you to track how people find your site. So do they find it on different social media applications? Was it the first thing that came up on Google? What keywords were people using? And you can track the origin of how people came to your website. Now what Google Analytics does is it measures the success of your site using dimensions, and these are the attributes of data, so basically broken down could be the city where most people are accessing your site from, and Google Analytics measures your success using dimensions, and these are attributes of your data, so they could go and look into things like which part of the world are the most people accessing your site from, is, are there particular areas that people are, are you know, that you're popular in? Um, 
is there a certain social media like Instagram where a lot of people are clicking on links to your page and this helps you establish where you are drawing in the most customers. Then there's something called metrics. Now metrics are the quantitative measurements of those dimensions, so how they are going to measure it. So if you're looking at how your an advert that you put up is doing online, you can go and see how many people have actually come to your site through that advert or made purchases based on seeing that advert. Now when we say web traffic, there are a lot of different traffic types. So we're going to quickly talk through a few of those. So firstly, there is organic, and that is because people have typed in keywords, so like Shaw Academy, and that has brought them to your site. There's referrals, so that could be another site uh, in a similar industry, so often you'll go into an airline and they will have accommodation or car hire linked in, so that would be referrals. You've got direct, it's when people type in exactly your URL, so www.showacademy.com. You've got email marketing, which is spread through your email campaigns sent through marketing teams. And then there's also paid traffic, and paid traffic is any customer that visits your website after you've paid for advertising, and that can be known as paid per click or PPC, and that is advertising that utilizes Google AdWords. And last but not least, social media, so people that have been drawn to your site from advertisements on Instagram or Facebook or any other social media sites you might be advertising on. Your bounce rate is measured by if a user visits your site and leaves without interacting with the page. So they log on and they don't click any, any buttons or navigate any further and then leave your site, then they would be measured as part of your bounce rate. Then we have session time, which can be calculated with one of two formulas. So if they're only visiting one page, so it'll be the last time that they hit the page or interacted with the page, minus the first time that they interacted with the page. So what that'll do is establish a time frame in which they spent. Or Then we have session time, which is calculated with one of two formulas. The first being if they've only interacted with one page. So that will be the last page hit, so the last time they interacted with the page, and then the first page hit. So that will determine the amount of time that they spent on your page. And if they're viewing multiple pages, you will take the first, so one page, then the last page hit of the visit, minus the first page hit of the visit. So using it in this context, it'll be the total time spent on your site, inclusive of all the different pages on your site. Then we have conversion rate optimization. So what is a conversion rate? Well, a conversion rate measures the amount of, of users who perform the action the website was designed for. So if you have a retail site, how many people are actually purchasing your product on that site? So just as an example, if the site has 200 visitors and 25 people buy the product, the calculation would read as follows. And that would be 25 divided by 200, which would then equal 12.5%. So you would have a 12.5% conversion rate. Let's talk about profits and return on investments. We're just going to briefly cover these for now and return to it again in later modules. But just so that you have an understanding, profits are the money made after all of your expenses have been paid. And return on investment evaluates the gain or loss to the investment relative to the amount of money that you spent. Your return on investment can be calculated as the current value of the investment minus the cost of your investment, and then you divide that by the cost of investment again. At that point, you will get your return on investment. Okay, so I think I have given you all enough to think about today. Let's quickly go through what is coming up in 